say is lit, right? <laughs> lit, lit, lit. Uhuru comrades, and welcome to today's Omali Tommy Sunday study, live with the leader of the African nation, Chairman Omalia Shatella. The theme of our discussion is 50 years of leadership toward African redemption. For today's study, we begin with a showing of the documentary, Relentless 50 Years of Leadership Toward African Redemption, a one hour video that highlights the work, struggles, and victories of Chairman Omalia Shatella and the African People's Socialist Party. Following the documentary, I will introduce the chairman who will be reading from chapter five of An Uneasy Equilibrium titled The History of the Party. Before we start the documentary, I want to encourage everyone watching to like, comment, and share no matter what platform you're tuning in from. This documentary was produced for the party's third seventh Congress plenary hosted in February of this year. Please enjoy this relatively short recap of our party over the last 50 years. For 600 years, Africa has lived under the colonial rule of imperialist white power. The European invasion that led to the capture of our land and resources, the enslavement and forced dispersal of our people, has resulted in our centuries-long colonial domination. The colonial slave trade, where African people were turned into commodities for sale, birthed the parasitic economic system of capitalism, which allowed for the once feudal, war-ridden Europe to save itself through the rape and pillage of our Africa and the theft of our labor. For centuries, African people have been forced to live under the most humiliating, inhumane conditions. The atrocities committed against our people since the first European set foot in Africa is impossible to enumerate here. But African people have always struggled against our colonizers to reclaim our dignity, lives, and future as evinced in leaders like Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Harriet Tubman, Nat Turner, Marcus Garvey, and Malcolm X. As recently as the Black Power Movement of the 1960s, we saw African people engaged in the anti-colonial struggle for power in tandem with world struggles being made by Cuba, Kenya, Vietnam, and others. Revolution was the main trend in the world, and the African Revolution was largely recognized as the catalyst that would bring about the total destruction of white power. It was during this height that the U.S. government assaulted our movement with the counterinsurgency, a war without terms that saw our leaders gunned down, thrown into prisons, slandered, and our communities reeling from the imposed crack epidemic. Today, we see the white world driven into chaos through the crisis of this social system. This new period that can be characterized as the ascendancy of the slave is seeing the system of colonial capitalism crumbling in rapid fashion. This period was ushered in through the efforts of the African People's Socialist Party, in which the history of the African liberation struggle is concentrated. 
It was the birth of a revolutionary party of the African working class and the leadership of one Chairman Omali Ishitela that has allowed us to reset the course for African independence. This is Relentless, 50 years of leadership toward African redemption. Well, I'm Omale Chetel. I'm chairman of the African People's Socialist Party and leader of the Uhuru Movement. Um, I was really fortunate in so many ways in, as an African at the time that I was born, uh, where uh, everywhere uh, within the African community, there was discussions of what was happening with black people. You couldn't go to any any home and you didn't have to be radical or militant and, and in fact most of the people we're talking probably didn't belong to any kind of organization except their local churches so uh, there was a deep kind of consciousness about uh, the brutality they um, imposed on us and uh, and things like that and that helped early on to shape my consciousness in fact um, i remember an incident in, in high school that contributed to my leaving high school in my senior year uh, was um, uh, really popular and very erudite uh, uh, a professor, a teacher. And uh, I went to him, um, it must have been for something like government, uh, something to that uh, effect. And, and he made the comment in, um, in class that uh, black people would have to prove ourselves to white people before we could be free, something like that. And, I challenged him on that, you know. I, I told him I, I completely disagreed, you know, like with that. And and um, uh, he, he, other students in the in the class, you know, jumped to defend the, the professor's or the teacher's uh, statement. And that was that was significant to me. I, mem I guess I, I still remember it today. So it was an outstanding thing, but everything was outstanding. I mean, just the. Uh, there was no way you could live uh, and not be aware. I, I learned to read when I was very, very young, very small child. And um, so I read all the time and that was, that's proved to be quite helpful for me. Uh, and um, I, the, 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 the military, U.S. military was having this campaign about, you know, join the army and see the world, that kind of thing. And uh, I felt, uh, I was somehow concluded that uh, the limitations that I was experiencing uh, in this city uh, as an African had to do with uh, this small city that I lived in and what have you down south, et cetera. So I felt uh, that uh, I would go into the army. And uh, my father admonished me, telling me like it's like it's like breaking into jail. He said you don't want to do that, but I went anyway. And I'm and he was right, and I was right. <clears throat> and the thing that made it right for me was quite accidental, uh, in that I was uh, I was sent to Berlin, Germany, and uh, got to see part of the world and, and and people and things like that I never would have seen uh, experienced. I was born and grew up in Florida. So I first faced the first really cold weather of my life in Berlin, in Germany. <clears throat> and I'm, I remember sitting in this in these tanks. These are tanks of steel, uh, uh, and it is freezing. I mean, and I remember, that, but we have the radios and we could listen uh, to the radios. And <clears throat> this woman um, uh, uh, from, uh, the Soviet Union or, uh, or from uh, Eastern uh, Germany, uh, speaking English over the radio. They had radio programs, you know, and we listened to it because they had good music. And I never forget this woman saying something to the effect that this next song you're gonna hear is called Peace Down Earth by Louis Armstrong, Peace Down South by Louis Armstrong, but of course there has been no peace down south for such and such a thing. And she, I, I never forget that she dropped that gem right there, and then the civil rights movement is heating up in the United States while I'm there. So that informed me a lot. And anyway, I ended up uh, uh, being sent back to uh, uh, to Georgia. I left Germany, uh, being sent to Georgia, and had all kinds of. By now, I'm I'm an angry. I'm extremely angry because I'm aware of what's happening to us. And I get to Georgia, this this base. And I see these Africans, they would go to town 
uh, on pastors and what have you, come back all blooded, beaten up and what have you because of, of what white people were doing to them in, the, in those places. And, and uh, other stuff was happening throughout Georgia, you know, so-called civil rights movement and uh, et cetera. Shortly after the chairman was discharged from the military, events continued to unfold throughout the world, radicalizing him in the process. It wasn't long after that chairman contacted the headquarters of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. He established the first membership-based SNCC organization in Florida. It was as a member of SNCC that the famous mural struggle on December 29, 1966 occurred. An eight by 10 foot white nationalist mural that hung in the St. Pete City Hall government building was torn down by the chairman. This first act of black power was the precursor to the Black Panther Party storming the California State Capitol building on May 2nd, 1967. And so we, we started demonstrating uh, around the mural. We would start off in the African community and walk downtown, and we would do that on several occasions. And then on this one day, uh, December 29th, uh, uh, we uh, were marching through the African community, and this older woman, uh, she, uh, you know, quickly threw on a robe and some, and some house shoes and joined the march. She wanted to wait for her. Uh, and um, so when we got down to the city hall and we're standing up on the steps of city hall, speaking from that platform, uh, the sister, this woman, when she started talking, she was complaining about how insurance companies, this was typical, would take African money, Africans money for years and then something happened and then there was no money. So she, that's, this was her complaint. And as she was standing there talking and, uh, uh, her English wasn't that good and what have you. And the white cops and reporters who were standing in front, they started laughing at her. And uh, that infuriated me, that really infuriated me. So I, uh, we had not planned to take that mural down. Then we had talked about how it could be done in a very embarrassing way for them because we said, we can put on some coveralls and stuff like that and, uh, and things like that and put a rag in our back pocket and walk in there with a ladder and some boards and we can go there and take it down in public view. Nobody would have thought anything because that's what black people are supposed to be doing, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so we had talked about that, uh, but we had not planned to take that mural down that day. This is an eight by 10 foot uh, <clears throat> mural that's been on the wall for 30 years or so. And uh, we had written letters about the mural uh, to the mayor, and uh, <laughs> Herman Goldner, yeah. So uh, we had we had uh, complained about it, and you know he had sent most ridiculous kinds of comments, just the most arrogant kind of white nationalist comment, comments. So when the woman did that, I turned to my heel and I walked into the uh, into the city hall, <clears throat> and Jody Wall, who was 17 at the time, he 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 followed me in. And I started looking for a place that uh, that, that mural could be taken from the wall, and I found a little place, and I ripped it down. It sounded like a roar in the in this city hall thing, and uh, um, and we marched out. Anyway, they arrested us, and um, they uh, charged us charged me with eleven different offenses, and they gave others, you know, a serious a number of offenses. And their objective was to make sure that they got us on as much as they could. Uh, and uh, they would have uh, courts at something like eight, nine o'clock at night, you know, we've been dragged into courts and things like that, extraordinary process. And because they were afraid, uh, they were afraid because uh, the cop who arrested me, he was literally trembling. When he grabbed my arm, he was trembling because this was a new breed of African. They had never run into this before. And we were talking about black power, et cetera, and they knew we had no regard at all for them. And uh, uh, so, so they jailed uh, us, jailed me. I went to, uh, they, they, they charged me, uh, like I said, with 11 different offenses. And then uh, they sent me to prison uh, on the felony uh, for grand larceny. And, uh, uh, and that was uh, a trip, you know, believe me. The struggle was on. 
During this period, activists were consistently attacked and thrown in jail, including Chairman Amalia Shetela. Despite their attempts to stifle the chairman's leadership, in 1968, the chairman formed the Junta of Militant Organizations, or JOMO, and published the Burning Spear newspaper. Chairman organized all throughout the state of Florida, and JOMO became a formidable black power organization within the U.S. My name is Chimaringa C. Lambao. I'm the National Director of Organization for the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, that's a good question. I was in Joba. I was uh, 17 years old, and I was recruited by Chairman Omali Shitella, who happened to be my oldest brother. So um, I guess I had a it was sort of a genes thing. Uh, so uh, other members of my family were politically active as well. He recruited several other members of, of our family. Um, so at the time I was in high school, I was in my senior year in high school, going into my senior year. This was the summer of 1968. Uh, so in the middle of uh, the summer, in August of 1968, there was a sanitation worker strike. So Jomo was kind of built off of that sanitation worker strike. So the chairman, other members of Jomo would get at the tail end of the demonstrations that were held, happening on a daily basis in support of, yeah, I should say that the whole African community supported the sanitation workers, which were almost all black. <clears throat> so. Every day there would be marches in support of the sanitation workers. So Jomo would get at the tail end of these marches. And at some point uh, we might even veer off and go in another direction, <laughs> but, but we would take part of it and then it would go the other way with the other part of it. Uh, it was being led by a man named Joe Savage, who was uh, sort of the elder person in, in the sanitation workers. But they had some very uh, young militant members of uh, the sanitation workers. One of them was Fred Winters. But that is how that that motion and activity uh, was also in the aftermath of the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King um, that April earlier, some months earlier. So the, the it was a tense situation all over the United States for African people in the first place. And then this was a perfect set of political circumstances for the building of the Hunter Militant Organization. In the height of the counterinsurgency, Chairman Omali and Jomo continued to organize throughout the state of Florida and the South, establishing branches, holding Uhuru festivals, leading struggles to free our political prisoners, continuing publication and distribution of the Burning Spear newspaper, all the while summing up the world situation through the point of view of the African working class. It was through these organizing efforts that Chairman Met Couture Carey, founder of the Gainesville Black Study Group, and Lawrence Mann, founder of the Black Rights Fighters in Fort Myers, Florida. All three organizations will come together to consolidate the African People's Socialist Party on African Liberation Day in May of 1972. The party in its infancy had assumed a major task to solve the outstanding problems of the Black Revolution. Solving the problems consisted of identifying the fundamental one plaguing African people throughout the world. This led to the chairman publishing colonialism the major problem confronting African people in the U.S. This document was groundbreaking. Colonialism being asserted as the primary contradiction provided our struggle with coherence and a to what end. Identifying colonialism as the core presented struggles within different political sectors of the African liberation movement. The conclusions that the party would come to based on our understanding of colonialism were not universally agreed upon conclusions. Nevertheless, the party did not surrender to the opportunists, the imperialist white left. We fought relentlessly 
and that every opportunity struggled principally as to advance the understandings throughout our movement. This understanding would lay the foundation for African internationalism. I think it was really in the 1960s where we began to see uh, more Africans who were involved in struggle, able to identify the struggle of African people in the United States as colonialism. I think that was a major thing that we have begun, and we were, if you look through that period of time and read the different stuff that I was writing and that we were writing about, you can see, you know, that there were elements of, uh, of uh, confusion around certain questions, but we were constantly zeroing in, you know, looking at it, um, at the question, stripping it, examining it, you know, uh, et cetera, and, and moving with it. The colonial question was critical. Defining this colonialism, that's, <clears throat> that's like the ultimate issue, because you cannot fight against colonialism and still be an American. You, you can't hang on to America in fighting against colonialism. I think even some of the most ardent black communists, black nationalists and what have you, I think that's part of even what the five state thing is, not wanting to give up some version of American Americanism. And uh, so the colonial question was, a, was spoke with finality. You can end this relationship, that's what it is. Uh, uh, and the colonial question became extremely important. And this whole thing about, you know, fighting against racism and colonialism is just uh, like being an African American. It's just trying to hang on uh, to this uh, uh, America. To fight against racism is to improve America. And uh, why would you want to improve uh, this system of oppression? Colonialism, as the fundamental problem, placed another outstanding question into its proper context. What to do with the white people? Up to this period, this question was answered with philosophical idealist conclusions, relegating white people to mutants, monsters, and devils. This explanation did nothing to help us understand how we as African people are going to win our freedom. It was African internationalism that declared white people are people too and they have a responsibility to the African Revolution under the leadership of the African working class. This understanding led to the founding of the African People's Solidarity Committee, the party-led organization of white people working in the interests of the African Revolution. While the white left were busy withdrawing their support and turning against the Black Power movement, APSC would be the vehicle we used to draw the line in the sand. We drove the struggle directly into the belly of the beast the colonizer population. In the beginning, some of the primary work of APSC was to bring resources back to the African Revolution, holding various types of fundraisers that would set the foundation for many of our economic institutions. They gathered resources from their own colonizer population in support of major party campaigns, such as the struggle to free Desi Woods. This was a bold advancement that the party fought to win. Now, the brilliant strategy behind APSC and its mass organization, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, further evinces the correctness of our position. Um, I just want to say that I think that the, the history of the African People's Socialist Party is really critical for the world to know. And the founding of the African People's Solidarity Committee was part, a very important part, of Chairman O'Malley to tell us solving the problems left to him unresolved from the African, the defeat of the African Revolution of the 1960s. And, and one of them was what to do about the white people. How should, what should the African Revolution's relationship to white people be? So the founding of the African People's Solidarity Committee, which took place in St. Petersburg, Florida in 19... 76 was incredibly historic. You know, the chairman laid out that they were building a cadre organization, more than a mass organization, a cadre organization to, for political and material support for the party and for the African Revolution. And, um, a, you know, a number of people signed up for it, but it was very short-lived with that. And, and, and it took the party 
until 1985, almost 10 years really, to consolidate and win those of us who were members of the African People's Solidarity Committee to really become African internationalists and unite with the leadership of the African Revolution as our revolution, as this is that we could come to the same conclusions. Perhaps one of the most profound party-led campaigns, the struggle to free Desi Woods smash colonial violence, allowed us to raise up the colonial question and negate the ideological influence of the imperialist white left. During this period, we would meet Omawali K. Fing, a revolutionary giant and member of the party. He was a central organizing force, working alongside 19-year-old Demisha Black Earth, leader of the National Committee to Defend Desi Woods. The case surrounded Woods, an African woman who was sentenced to 22 years in prison for successfully defending herself and friend Cheryl Todd against a colonial rape attempt by a white man in 1975. This campaign had worldwide support, as the Committee to Defend Desi Woods toured internationally. We held countless demonstrations throughout the U.S., including the first demonstration to ever happen inside Plains, Georgia, the hometown of James Earl Carter, U.S. president sitting during the time of this campaign. The slogan to smash colonial violence became a dividing line. The opportunism of the white left was expressing itself in a profound way, as they attempted to make the primary issue one based on women's rights. We were told it would be easier to make this a feminist issue, but we held firm, and after intense struggle made by the people, in 1981, Desi X. Woods was a free woman. During this time, where the party was receiving support and participation from all over, the party organized the African National Prison Organization, a mass organization that brought Africans back into political life with the question of political prisoners. The work to build the party was transforming. The chairman presented the political aspects to building a mass movement, the tactical and strategic objectives for black liberation in 1977 at a black organizers conference at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. This presentation, published in the pages of the Burning Spear newspaper, was widely studied throughout the African liberation movement and would inform the way in which we do work going forward. When the party came out and said smash colonial violence, that was it. Because that made you have to reckon with the state. And if you know it's the state doing it, not some far off idea in somebody's head called racism, then you know that if you're in solidarity, you are choosing to be in solidarity with the African working class and oppressed peoples of the world. And you're not, you can't hide, you can't hide out anymore. You're gonna really, gonna really acknowledge it because if it's colonialism, we're a part of it. Colonialism cannot exist on its own. I mean, you can have bad ideas, racist ideas about someone. It does not connect you to them in any way. But when it's colonialism, there has to be a colonizer and a colonized. And that's, that is the ultimate truth that really is what organizes one in a principled relationship with the African working class, the African revolution. Oakland, California had been a hotbed for African revolution due to it being the birthplace of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. In many ways, it had been the center of the Black power movement and with our work surrounding the Desi Woods campaign and building the Solidarity Front, the party would bring the movement back to life in this city. For 12 years in the 1980s and early 90s, Oakland was the national headquarters of our party. We would conduct our party's first Congress in Oakland in 1981. The party intervened in countless struggles, especially in regards to housing, homelessness, and rent control. In 1984, we led the Community Control of Housing Initiative known as Measure O, which organized numerous volunteers who delivered more than 300,000 flyers to the doorsteps of Oakland residents, which resulted in winning 29,000 votes on the ballot. 
our fierce struggles resulted in the takeover of an abandoned house in East Oakland for a homeless family, a generation before the rise of the Occupy movement. We fought the slumlords every step of the way while bringing the African community of Oakland back into political life. The party conducted the second historical Freedom Summer project, and in a short time, we built a movement and opened the Uhuru House on MacArthur Boulevard. Huey P. Newton, chairman of the Black Panther Party, made his last speeches at the Uhuru House, passing the torch to the APSP after stating, the Uhuru House, okay. you might not have the, uh, It was the party who, following Newton's assassination in 1989, led a major campaign to change the narrative around Huey. After the media slandered him, all of their headlines reading from prime minister to bum. The party declared that we would change those headlines by the time Huey's funeral came. We waged a scorched earth campaign, covering every surface with images and slogans extolling Huey. We also played a huge role in organizing his funeral, having even printed the program. Huey was right. The Black Revolution still had a pulse. Along with our Uhuru House, we would develop more community programs like the Bobby Hutton Freedom Clinic, Uhuru Bakery and Cafe, Spear Graphics, Uhuru Foods and Pies, Uhuru Furniture, and more. We would recruit Bakri Olatunji, one of the leading members of our party today. We would see a powerful leader in the form of Biko Lumumba and develop a fraternal relationship with Unión del Barrio, the Mexican Liberation Organization. In addition, we raised Lavelle Mixon up as an African martyr, defining this issue for our community after he killed four Oakland cops in March of 2009 in an act of African resistance. It has been the party's history in Oakland that has sustained the African community's revolutionary fervor through countless forums, campaigns, marches, and more. Today, the demand for reparations is being hotly debated. Case studies are being done by institutions as a means to legitimize reparations to African people in the U.S. The same forces who were vocally opposed to the demand are now proposing various types of reform or poverty programs as reparations. But why are they discussing this now? It's because the party determined that we would make reparations a household word over 40 years ago. In 1981, the party revised and adopted our 14-point working platform with point number 11 being, we want the US and the international European ruling class and states to pay Africa and African people for the centuries of genocide, oppression, and enslavement of our people. We took this demand to the streets to be embraced by the African masses. In 1982, the party held the first of 12 consecutive world tribunals in Brooklyn, New York, where Chairman Amalia Shetela served as the people's advocate. The proceedings of this tribunal employed the use of international law to prove our case and indict the U.S. on the crime of genocide against African people. The first tribunal featured testimonials from different sectors of the African nation, raising up the crime of genocide as it related to education, poverty, health care, prisons, and more. Among the speakers was Comrade Mafundi Lake, political prisoner in the state of Alabama, Afani Shakur, former member of the Black Panther Party and mother of Tupac Shakur. In our work to build for the first tribunal, we met fierce revolutionary Gaida Cambon and built the African National Reparations Organization. The consecutive tribunals would take place throughout the U.S. They would gain news coverage and interests of Africans from all over. This was not the extent of our reparations work, however. During the Reagan administration and the threat of government assistance cutbacks, the party raised the slogans they say cut back, we say pay back, reparations now, and food stamps hell, reparations now. The responsibility of APSC began to expand, fight for reparations to the African Revolution, organize among the colonizer population for reparations to the party's self-determination programs. We, uh, as the party built 
the tribunal on reparations to African people, the initial tribunal was in Brooklyn, New York in 1982. That was another chapter, you know, but that was all connected to the same period. But um, the, just the party taking on, raising up the demand, a mass demand in the African working class for reparations to African people as a revolutionary demand. And, you know, something that no, none of the African petty bourgeoisie or white left would support that at all at that time. The African People's Socialist Party is regarded as 21st century Garveyites. Marcus Garvey organized 11 million Africans into the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, raising up the slogan, Africa for Africans, at home and abroad, in recognition that we are one African people. African fundamentalism, the worldview that informed the Garvey movement, has been advanced through the leadership and work of Chairman Omali Ishitela into African internationalism. African internationalism brought us to the same conclusion, that we are one African people, and our task is to unite and organize the entire globally dispersed African nation under the leadership of a revolutionary party of the African working class. That is why, at the party's first Congress in 1981, it was resolved to build the African Socialist International. 50 years of African People's Socialist Party leadership has transformed the African National Liberation Movement. When you think of the, uh, the work the chairman has produced in terms of theory, uh, because uh, until that moment, when you talked about revolutionary theory for national liberation for world socialism, you have to look into Lenin and Mao and others. Uh, but when you look at the work the chairman has produced, you see the intensity, uh, the depthness, you know, uh, just the, you know, of uh, the scientific worldview that uh, he has developed, uh, and which uh, basically he's now in the hands of the African working class, is just historical. It's just like uh, uh, a earthquake, you know, uh, you know, that basically shakes everything, changes everything. Uh, what we have done just to to connect Africans uh, from everywhere. Uh, from London, we were able to to go everywhere. Uh, when you think in a, in the year two thousand, you know, in the nineties, you know, we went, we searched, and that was before the first SI conference in nineteen ninety nine. We contacted every organization we heard of, uh, particularly between nineteen ninety five and nineteen ninety nine, uh, and uh, sometimes with success, like the Ivory Coast uh, uh, comrade at the time. Uh, so we made different groups. Uh, they, there is no group that we didn't reach, uh, you know, if we believed there was a potential to win them to, to the ASI. And we could do that because we were armed with African internationalism. You know, the correctness of that philosophy just gives you the authority to go anywhere and, uh, you know, engage with any organization. Uh, you feel that you should win them to, to the ASI. In fact, every time you went somewhere, we were breaking new grounds. Like, for example, when we went to France, Belgium, Germany, and so on, uh, we did the ALD. Uh, in the first one in 2012, people, you know, the African people don't really do ALD in Paris. Uh, we introduced it there. Uh, not only we introduced the ALD, we introduced also a newspaper, you know, a uh, working class newspaper, a revolutionary working class newspaper. For example, this is the first uh, bilingual. We had a uh, for the first LD, you can see it's here April or May 2012. You know, that is in French, you know, Expression des Familles Africaines à la Courneuve. So we gave voice to the African working class being expelled uh, by uh, the French uh, uh, state, you know, defending the African working class right to decent housing, you know. Uh, so and when you flip the newspaper, you get the English side, you know, uh, basically half is English, half is French. So that's new ground because the African working class never had a newspaper of his own uh, anywhere until a burning spear, you know, uh, was given to them. And we went to Germany, uh, we had meetings in Frankfurt, we had meetings in Berlin, we had meetings in Wuppertal, and there are all these places we introduced Africans to the new uh, evangelism, 
you know, revolutionary evangelism for the African nation. That if you unite with this uh, thinking, if you put this in practice, you will definitely build a new African nation. Our work extended throughout Africa, Europe, and the Caribbean, recruiting party members and building organization on the ground, establishing our influence and worldview in every place we touched. That they believe in United Africa, for all Africans will come together and be able to join God's benefits upon Africa. How can they then go to the ANC, who says that Africa belongs to all who live here? There is no principle in that sense. I am sorry. the party's founding. Chairman Amalia Shetela recognized that the African Revolution was inherently connected to liberation struggles happening around the world. We demonstrated this by participating in the Puerto Rican Socialist Party influenced Bicentennial Without Colonies in 1976, holding demonstrations in solidarity with the struggle of Iranian peoples starting in 1979, speaking at a conference in solidarity with the FSLN government of Nicaragua representing the African nation in 1981. In our work to build the African Socialist International, we conducted a tour to France and England in 1983 and met with the Irish Republican Socialist Party in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Shortly after the chairman's visit, their headquarters was burned down and their leader assassinated. In 2015, the chairman would represent Africa at the Dialogue of Nations Conference held in Moscow, Russia. The chairman has taken African internationalism everywhere. And just as Ho Chi Minh looked to Garvey, it became increasingly clear that the African revolution will free up all of humanity. Through our work building the African National Prisons Organization and the African National Reparations Organization, we had established the basis for mass organizing. However, in 1991, the party founded the National People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, later to become the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, (IPDM) in Chicago, Illinois, the place where former Black Panther Party leader Fred Hampton had been assassinated. IPDM was founded to bring the African masses back into political life as well as recruit a reserve pool of forces to bring into the party. Through Impedum, we have waged many anti-colonial campaigns to defend the democratic rights of the African community. The first president of Impedum was Nkura Njeri, a widow of Fred Hampton and mother of Fred Hampton Jr., who the party defended after being stuck with an 18-year prison sentence for a framed-up arson charge. Perhaps one of the most historic struggles involving Impedum was the pitched battle between the African community and the colonial state in St. Petersburg, Florida in 1996. The St. Pete police murdered 18-year-old Tyron Lewis on October 24, 1996. The aftermath led to two intense battles and a city forever changed. This struggle was known as the Battle of St. Pete. So the Battle of St. Pete. 
Whew. Now see that was like interesting times. And I say interesting because, you know, I had never ex experienced rebellion. You know, I know St. Pete has a history of, of rebellion, you know, and and the and the fact that the party is the is the reason why the people are, you know, have the, you know, a connection and understanding the, the, the material relationship that uh, you know, that we have with this system. And people can identify, you know, where the problem's at, you know. And the Battle of St. Pete, it's crazy because um, <laughs> it was uh, October 24th is when Tyrone Lewis was murdered. And I wasn't on the scene then, um, but I found out about it. It's it crazy. Well, I had a baby, and she was born on the 22nd. So I was in a, in a rough situation as far as relationships wise, but I was totally oblivious to what was happening because I, cause I lived, I had, I was living like 6th Avenue North might have been and 33rd Street and like I said I was having a rocky relationship situation I had a, had a newborn child born on the 22nd and on the 24th that evening after she was, uh, before she was sent home from the hospital um, I went to, it was on 34th Street and 5th Avenue North at the gas station I think it was a Chevron at the time and I went to use uh, the phone, and you know, the pay phone. And I saw these cops, you know, it was probably about three of them or so, and they were in full riot gear. You know, I don't know what's going on. So I pull up, use the, you know, the pay phone, and they cursing me out, telling me to get on by my way. I'm like, what is your problem? Like, Why y'all dressed like that? You know, you look kind of foolish. And so one of them was like, oh, he don't know. Okay, so, you know, I made my way back to, to you know, back to the south side. Um, to the house that I was, um, that I had moved to. It said right on uh, uh, Tyrone Lewis Avenue, formerly, formerly 18th Avenue South. And when I got to the, got, got, I got to the South Side, you saw it was nighttime. It, it, had, it, had, it had reached night at that time, and you saw like in the horizon, it's like blazes. It was like luminous light, <laughs> you know, red. It was yellow. It was. I'm looking. I'm like, what the heck's going on? So I jumped in that 6'5 and pile out here and hit down the road. One significant event when, um, they had, when the pigs attacked um, the Uhura house. Uh, and I think in the paper they said they, unlo they, they unloaded uh, all the, the tear gas canisters they had in, in, in the city of St. Pete. Now that's a lot. And when they, when they um, discharged those, um, those canisters, they, they're on fire when they discharge them. And I, the... It was an MP done meeting on the 13th of Wednesday, and I was a little late getting there. Um, I was working at a at a at a, at a group home, and right in Koki the Key. So I'm, I'm I'm loading the boys up in the van. So I'm like, you know, I got to get to this meeting. So <laughs> we get there, the roads are blocked off, you know, and and I see the commotion. I see the police shooting this tear gas and stuff at you know at the building that cars, and there's a lot of smoke and you see fire. Um, and they were like de uh, deliberately shooting tear gas at the trees to set the trees on fire. So I was able to maneuver the van through the community and get out and we ran up, ran up. So um, um, I, I, I took a water hose from the back and just started immediately trying to put the, um, put the, put the fires out that, that they started. And, and it, was, it, was, it was crazy. And I, and I looked and I saw the side door bust open and people trying to get out and they're shooting tear gas at people like they were trying to kill people you know no joke they were trying to kill people and when i say when you're grounded in the community and there there's this uh, you know and the fact that that the, the movement has been has been here so long the people understand who they need to protect and when i say i look to my right and it felt like an army of young people rushing down the road and they identify what we identify later as ghost face <laughs> they put the t-shirts around their, around their, 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 their faces and when I say they protected and saved lives this community did that protecting and saved lives and whatever ammunition they had they unloaded them and you saw you saw the same people least they fell back now you heard them saying fall back fall back <laughs> they on the heavy fight they were they were. Tear gas starts coming through the front door. And 
Now it's a panic, a total panic. People are, are scrambling, so we lead them into the back room of the whorehouse, which is actually a gym at the time. Uh, a whore's gym of my own, black gym of my own. So that door separated the main hall from the gym. So we're getting people to come back in the back as the room, as this room is filling up tear gas. And as a matter of fact, I remember Pop Lancaster took some pictures of the tear gas boom, boom, starting to fill. I had a very uh, pivotal moment as I coughed from the tear gas in the back. I remember very vividly, I mean, people are coughing and trying to recover from the tear gas. And the chairman very calmly looked at me and he says, St. Pete will never be the same if we survive. And I remember thinking, that's not a very reassuring statement. Today, in PETAM is headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri, following the party's building efforts since the Ferguson Rebellions of 2014. Columbia and Danette was appointed as the president, and under her leadership, we've seen Impedum grow its international presence, advance major campaigns like Africans Charge Genocide, Black Community Control of the Police, and more. 2021 marked 30 years of existence for the organization. In 2015, the party also consolidated the African National Women's Organization, or ANWO, to open up our mass front by explicitly organizing African working class women whose significance in shaping the future has ordinarily been undermined through backwards ideas. We also found ANWO to be strategic to challenge the bourgeois ideology of feminism, to instead arm African working class women with their own theory. ANWO is an international organization that has built a presence throughout the US, in Europe, and Africa, and is led by President Yedide Orunila. The variety offered through our mass organizing efforts has resulted in the party's incalculable reach. Our party is well known for our beloved economic institutions. Today, scores of shoppers patronize our furniture stores in Oakland, California, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Many vendors and customers alike look forward to our One Africa, One Nation markets or our Holiday Uhuru Pies campaigns. The Uhuru movement today has over 50 economic institutions and programs, bringing economic self-reliance to the work of the party and establishing dual and contending power to negate the influence of colonial capitalism. The chairman introduced the concept of dual and contending power to the world and it has characterized all of our economic development initiatives. Our oldest institution to date is the Burning Spear newspaper, in print for 53 years. The reparations fundraisers transformed into the institution well known as Uhuru Foods and Pies, based in St. Petersburg, Florida and Oakland, California. Following the 1985 move bombing, the party went into Philly under the slogan, Reinforcements are on the way. This history of struggle helps to show we have fought tooth and nail for everything we've built. Through fierce battles, we established Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles, an institution of the African People's Education and Defense Fund. Today, located at 832 North Broad Street, this institution has spin-off businesses like Enzo, African Styles at Home and Abroad, and recently, Uhuru on the Move. We also built the One Africa, One Nation flea markets, health festivals, book fairs, all of which have been responsible for employing hundreds of African vendors. Through the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project, or APDEP, African Skills for African Liberation, the party opened up a new front to access scientists, doctors, and the like, to win them to turn their skills over to the African nation. Headquartered in Huntsville, Alabama, and under the leadership of Dr. Aisha Fields, APDEP has paved the way in African independent agriculture, with our community gardens in Huntsville and Houston, 
our disaster relief program, Project Black Ankh, was developed to negate the colonial Red Cross. We traveled to Sierra Leone during the Ebola crisis, built a maternal health clinic that helped to safely deliver 300 African babies, and in the last several years, APDEP has provided the African internationalist response to the colonial virus, COVID-19. The economic work is led by Deputy Chair Ona Zene Shetela, upon whose arrival represented a new era in party building. The work under DC Ona's leadership saw the rapid development and professionalism of our institutions and practices within the party. She instituted manuals and plans of actions, reporting processes, and in 2017, she developed the dynamic recruitment program known as the NTU Volunteer Brigade. She advanced the nonprofit sector of our movement through the African People's Education and Defense Fund and forged Black Star Industries, a longtime vision of the chairman, reflective of Garvey's Black Star Steamship Line and other economic initiatives that sought to free up African workers from the traps of colonial capitalism. Just as we did in Philly in the 80s and 90s, DC Ona went into St. Louis, Missouri and began work building the Black Power Blueprint Project. In the heart of the African working class community, we now have our Uhuru House Community Center, our Gary Brooks Community Garden, and One Africa, One Nation Market, our towering red, black, and green flag, housing for our African Independence Workforce Program, with a community basketball court, African Women's Health Center, and Bakery Cafe on the way. Within the last several years, we've also introduced the Buy Black Power campaign that allows for African business owners to connect, buy, and sell to one another as part of a conscious mission to economically empower the African community. This by no means is an exhaustive list of our work in this area. Our economic work has not solely been for the purposes of sustaining the African revolution. It is a part of the anti-colonial struggle to overthrow the system of colonial capitalism and lay the ground for an independent African economy. In 2008, with the selection of Barack Hussein Obama for U.S. President, the party initiated the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations, uniting African organizations to a basic set of principles. This formation helped to expose that the election of Obama represented the defeat of the Black Revolution of the 60s. Through this coalition, we have demystified neocolonialism or white power in Black faiths. We hold annual marches on the White House, bringing the demands of the African working class to the center of the so-called progressive anti-fascist movement. In 2015, the party held the Black People's Grand Jury to indict Darren Wilson with the murder of 18-year-old Mike Brown. During the rebellions, chairmen took to the streets of Ferguson, marching with the people and politicizing the situation at hand. Place else is because of young Africans right here in Ferguson who stood up for the I don't, I don't want to hear any criticism of these young Africans. No, 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 it is, it is because these young people stood up and they fought. They fought back like you're supposed to fight when you are occupied, when your community is occupied, and they're shooting you down in the streets. What you are supposed to fight back. Throughout our party's history, we have utilized the electoral arena as a means to build a mass movement, raising the demands of our community. In 2017, the party ran candidates in St. Petersburg, Florida, on a platform of reparations, gaining national coverage, including a profile in Ebony Magazine. In 2021, we ran Impedum President Columbai and Danette for Alderwoman in St. Louis under the slogan, Revolutionary Times, Revolutionary Solutions going up against a dynasty of neo-colonialists. In 2019, Chairman Amalia Shetelo represented the African nation at Oxford, debating the question of whether or not there should be a closer African union. 
The chairman's position received resounding applause as he was the clear winner. We have to be able to break out of this, but it's going to take revolution in order to do this. African revolution in order to do this. African revolution that will destroy imperialism and the world economy that's responsible for the growing immiseration of the masses of people around the world, Uhuru. And it doesn't stop there. The party continues to build, seizing new territory, leaving no arena uncontested. We've ushered in a new period of struggle and cadre members of our movement are being forged like steel. Uh, but the key thing is going to be whether Africans, we, assume responsibility for our future <clears throat> and assume responsibility uh, 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 for the future. And, uh, and Africa is critical to the future because here's where uh, the, the real communism is going to come about is because uh, the, the colonial mode of production built into itself the, its own disaster. It has uh, dispersed Africans all around the world. Every place we are located in Africa and other places central uh, to the production, the capitalist production as such. That means that organized, uh, ideologically uh, uh, informed uh, with the revolutionary theory and what have you, with the revolutionary party, uh, then Africa and African people have the ability to bring the entire thing down and to grow a new world. Uh, that's truly not primitive communism, but the real McCoy as a consequence of the, those of us, of us who function as the pedestal of this entire thing, uh, uh, get, get the power over our own lives, over the uh, productive processes uh, of the world and create a whole new mode of production. And, and so that's uh, what, what I think these 50 years uh, contributes to that we've been involved in uh, up to now. But only we, uh, can we, we hold the, 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 the winning hand uh, if we take advantage of who we are, where we're located in the world, the revolutionary theory that we produce, the revolutionary organization that we've created, uh, and, and this history of, uh, of this, this, this history of unending uh, struggle, this of, of our party that's representative of the history of our people, the relentless struggle for 50 years for the redemption of Africa, not <clears throat> for the, the freedom of some barbecue stand in, in the south of the United States, but for the redemption of Africa. It's our time. Uhuru. Uhuru. Well, I want to salute the continued struggle for the liberation of Africa and African people. Long live Chairman Amalia Shatella and the African Revolution. We are winning. So before I welcome the chairman onto the program, I'd like to take a moment for our Uhuru Movement announcements. Stop FBI attacks on the African People's Socialist Party and Chairman Amalia Shatella. Join the Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa defense campaign. Visit handsoffuhuru.org to sign the petition, get updates, and learn how you can get involved. And follow the campaign on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Hands Off Uhuru. The 2022 Days of Reparations to African People Speaking Tour, hosted by the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, calls on white people to stand in solidarity with the African community's right to advocate for and organize for their liberation and self-determination. This tour is mobilizing white people to stand in opposition to the U.S. government's attacks on the African liberation movement. As Chairman Amalia Shatella has stated, the stand of principled solidarity with the African working class led struggle for socialism and reparations represents for the first time in history, the way for white people to participate in genuine class struggle against the colonial capitalist system. This tour has already stopped in Oakland, California, Portland, Oregon, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This week, there are events in St. Petersburg, Florida, and Minneapolis, Minnesota. The tour culminates in a national march for reparations and conference on October 15th and 16th in St. Louis, Missouri. For more information, visit uhurusolidarity.org.
We're calling on people to get all out for the November 5th and 6th Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace and Reparations 14th Annual Black People's March on the White House in Washington, D.C. Again, that's November 5th and 6th. The march will happen on November 5th and you can register and get information. You can already book, reserve your hotel at blackisbackcoalition.org. And make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spirit TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Amali Taught Me Sunday Study and support the Amali Taught Me show by donating now at paypal.me slash Amali Taught Me. Uhuru Tours and Speakers Bureau is an institution of the African People's Socialist Party that coordinates events and tours for Chairman Amali Ishitela and other party speakers and leaders. Book Chairman Amali and other Uhuru Movement speakers for your campus or organization now you can email info at uhurutours.com or call 727-914-3621. <clears throat> and for other events not mentioned here, go to theburningsquare.com slash events calendar to check out everything going on in the Uhuru movement and also submit your event um, to be posted on the Burning Spears event calendar. And lastly, just want to call on people who have witnessed this incredible documentary that just shows a snapshot of the African People's Socialist Party 50-year history to join in this struggle, to take it on as your own. And you can do that today at APSPUhuru.org. Join the African Revolution. Join the African People's Socialist Party. So now we're going to return back to our program reminder for people to like share and comment on this video and get people into this discussion as many people as possible um, and i want to remind people to get your copy of an uneasy equilibrium out right now and if you do not have your copy make sure you order that today at the burning spirit Out store um, and we're going to be looking at chapter five the history of the party which um, i'm going to now introduce the leader of the african nation and worldwide african revolution chairman amalia chatella to take us through Chairman. Uhuru, uh, first of all, I really want to express my appreciation to you, Comrade Director Akili, um, for the introduction and for the extraordinary video uh, that we just uh, had the opportunity to view. I think uh, uh, it's important to say uh, to all of you who are participating in this study today from various places around the world, uh, that this study is happening in uh, the Uhuru House in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. <clears throat> and the Uhuru House in St. Petersburg, Florida uh, is the location of one of the attacks that was made against the African People's Socialist Party on July 29th uh, by uh, federal troops uh, uh, wearing FBI identification, camouflage, automatic weapons, assault weapons, and that kind of thing. Hundreds of them uh, attacked various uh, uh, institutions and homes, including uh, this place, the Uhuru House. Uh, you may have seen uh, that uh, this is not the first time that the federal government has attacked this building or that agents of the government, uh, whether it called itself federal uh, or whether it was local and county and state police and with National Guards uh, uh, in 1996, uh, where this building came under assault. Most recently on July 29th, they said that uh, the reason that they attacked us, uh, they stole our properties, they, they ran, uh, ransacked uh, our homes and, and offices and uh, they stole our files and documents. Uh, the reason they said they did it is because uh, the African People's Socialist Party and I uh, work for the Russians, that the Russians are the ones that are responsible uh, for the politics, the stance that we've taken, whether it's run for office in various places, whether it's uh, criticizing the United States government uh, in terms of the genocide uh, that's been uh, committed against African people. And the, this whole genocide thing, I just want to say, uh, is something that they define. When I say they, I'm talking about the colonizers, uh, not us. They define genocide. And anybody would go uh, and Google it yourself, uh, the uh, United Nations Convention on uh, the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, uh, you will see that everything that they talked about in that uh, applies to African people as well, but it was not intended to apply to us. And the fact is, uh, it was something like 1945 or 1948 uh, when the Genocide Convention uh, was passed. And this had to do with something, murder that white people were committing against other white people. Uh, and uh, there, 
was no such thing, no such term as genocide. Uh, when Africa came under assault by Europe, by white people, that is to say the whole process of consolidating the world economy, the social system that's now uh, being extraordinarily troubled. Uh, when this was going on, there was no word called genocide. Genocide only became something that was discussed uh, when white people were killing white people and it became necessary for them to establish rules of engagement, how uh, white people would uh, be permitted to deal with others and they created international law to deal with that. And that's where we come up with the genocide convention. But the point that I'm making is that it does apply to us. When you look at uh, what, call, what, what is defined as genocide clearly, uh, African people, clearly what they've done to indigenous peoples uh, here in this country, clearly what they've done to Vietnam, clearly what they've done in Libya and all around the world is nothing but what they have defined for themselves uh, as genocide. So uh, the U.S. Uh, government, the federal government, the United States government attacked us on July 29th in part. They said because it's the Russians who told us that uh, we should protest the United States uh, at the United Nations for, for genocide being committed against African people. They said it's the Russians uh, who told us that uh, this war that uh, the United States uh, and other colonial powers are engaged in through Ukraine uh, uh, is, uh, is something wrong with that, that we don't stand on the same side of the United States uh, uh, as, uh, uh, and, uh, on, in this attack uh, uh, on Ukraine. I know that many of the people who are here are aware of things like the, uh, the fascist and Nazi uh, connection uh, to those forces uh, in Ukraine uh, who are supposed to represent democracy uh, fighting against the horrible Russians. But I'm not even talking about that. That's not even the fundamental issue because fascism itself is simply a form of the state. And the state is simply the organization that has been created uh, that came into existence with class society coming, uh, making it necessary uh, to control and maintain the status quo. Uh, for us, the question is not the form of, a, of, a, of the state uh, as much as it is the fact that we're colonized, we're colonized people. So if a colonizer is a fascist or a colonizer is a Democrat, uh, for example, the fascism in Germany uh, that people are probably most familiar with, familiar with is Nazi, the horrible, 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 horrible Nazis. And I said for a long time that, that Churchill made Hitler look like a Boy Scout, uh, that uh, uh, Kit Carson, uh, who murdered indigenous people here, looked like made Hitler look like a Boy Scout, uh, that people uh, who are held up as great Democrats, Thomas Jefferson, uh, a baby raping, a child rapist, uh, genocidalists, you know, to, to talk about uh, somehow uh, 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 the, these are Democrats and then the others are fascists or conservatives misses the point. Our issue is that we are colonized as a people and the entire white world has lived off the flesh, the blood, uh, labor, resources, land, culture that's stolen from Africans and other people around the world. That's what we've been fighting against despite these spurious charges made against us by the United States government and why they attacked us in 19, uh, on, on July 29th. And so this whole issue uh, for us with the Ukraine question uh, is the fact that what we're seeing happening is a fracturing of the world order that has come into existence through colonial domination through, uh, through the, the, the emergence of a colonial mode of production uh, that has thrust the white people to uh, the surface on this platform of the suffering and enslavement of Africans and the vast majority of the people. Well, that's why we're on the attack because we're fighting against it because it shall not prevail. And it doesn't matter how many flashbang grenades they throw at us, no matter how many uh, pre-dawn raids uh, uh, that they come, uh, the fact is that African people and the oppressed are going to be free. So I think it's important that we are looking at the study today in terms of the history of the African People's Socialist Party. I thought the video was really important for that as well, uh, so that people, anybody uh, can see what our history is. It has nothing to do with Russians. It has everything to do with America. It has everything to do with colonialism. And the Americans and the Europeans and the colonizers are trying to uh, divert uh, this discussion in a way that you don't even get to talk about genocide against Black people. For example, they say the Russians paid us to, to say something about genocide, uh, 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 about the United States committing genocide. Uh, the, the, and the media has have uh, walked, worked hand in glove with them. In fact, it's an instrument of colonial state 
And so the media says, well, this is what, this is what the, did the Russians pay you to say genocide? Well, you, you, you are deliberately distorting the question. The real question is, if, you, if genocide has come up, the question for you is, is genocide being committed against black people? So regardless of whether the Russians or the Spaniards or whomever else said it, is it happening? That's the question they don't want to have. And so they want to dismiss the question, distort the issue, uh, create enough slander and throw up enough smoke and sand in people's eyes so you don't get to the real issue. The issue is, damn it, deal with the question of whether genocide is being committed against Black people. Deal with the question of the fact that uh, we ran elections that you say the Russians paid for. And what that election said was reparations now give us reparations. What the election said was that black community control of the police. That's the question that you want to dismiss by saying the Russians told us to say it. So I just think it's really important and I appreciate everybody's being here in the house uh, that black built, the house that black built and the house, the house that was attacked by the United States government. And I want you to consider this and I'll be talking more about this uh, on the event that's coming up is that Tuesday? Tuesday event. You should come to this event on, on Tuesday. But consider this. Here we are uh, in organizations of former slaves. You understand? Former slaves. Now, Black people did not voluntarily come to this land. We were kidnapped. Somebody brought us here against our will, and it wasn't Russians, right? And uh, brought us here against their will and imposed all kinds of terror and they built themselves as a part of a process. They built a tremendous amount of wealth when they stole from black people, but when they stole from the indigenous people, wouldn't be any so-called America if they hadn't taken this valuable land from the indigenous people here. So they take us, they take the other people, stolen land, built this thing, call the other people from whom they stole the land, call them uh, some kind of illegal aliens and things like that, and then lock some of them up in concentration camps that they call Indian reservations. Yes, that's the history. And then they kidnap me and bring me here. And, uh, and, uh, and all the time since I've been here, before I got here, I've been fighting against it. Ain't never been a time where black people were not trying to, uh, to get this white monkey off our back. Never has been a time, never will be a time when we don't fight, we gonna fight regardless of what you do, five o'clock in the morning in my house, our institutions, etc. That thing is dead that you had before. But here you have the, the, uh, a, a, a military force as it arguably the most powerful military force in the world certainly uh, puts more of its, uh, its treasure uh, into weapons and things like that than any country on earth. And they're attacking former slaves. They say they, they got a beef with Russia, but they don't attack St. Petersburg, Russia. They attack St. Petersburg, Florida, which by the way, is named for St. Petersburg, Russia, by a white man, not me. I didn't have anything to do with that, you understand? And this is the history that we are talking about that they want to, they want to obscure. They want to make mysterious. Somehow the Russians told us that white people have been murdering black people since we first met you. No, and you cannot terrorize us into stop saying that, organizing around it, Africa gonna be free. Africa is going to be united. African people are going to be free and united. That's just the way that's going to be. And that's why you're looking, every time you look into the world, you see the end of a social system. That's why somebody's Buffalo is going and killing uh, these, these young, these people talking about you will not replace us because they see history is replacing white power. That's why in 2020, uh, at, the, at the Munich uh, Security Conference that's uh, held every year, uh, where uh, 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 you have uh, heads of state, most important people like Zuckerberg, the one who put us in, in Facebook jail all the time, uh, Zuckerberg, uh, who uh, debating the question of the end, of the, the, the beginning of Westlessness, the era where the West disappears. Uh, and this is what we're looking at. So I just wanted to say those things and thank you again, Director, uh, for opening this up. And I know I've talked a long time uh, into the discussion that we're supposed to have, but I want you to look at uh, un an uneasy equilibrium. This is a, an extraordinarily important book. And this is the book that came uh, from, um, this is a political report from the sixth Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. And in the fifth chapter, it deals with the history of our party. 
And that takes us back to July 29 too, because we was doing this uh, uh, before anything that happened that looked like Ukraine, that, that is how it's being experienced today. Uh, and before anything that happened that looked like Putin, uh, that's being discussed today. Uh, before anything happened that looked like Biden or Trump, et cetera, this is who we are. And who we are and our history is about ending the oppression of African people, the theft of our resources, because you're thieves, you're thieves, you're thieves, you've stolen everything from black people, from the indigenous peoples of the world, and you continue to have a system of theft, of theft and thievery, a parasite that's landed on the body of humanity and, and who function as a host to keep you fat uh, at our expense. And now the host is rejecting the parasite and you're going through paroxysms of, uh, of uh, uh, various kinds of anxiety, fear, desperation. That's your problem. I ain't gonna make it my problem. We're gonna fight you around these colonial questions, these laws that you, these, these criminal offensive that you are alleging about us, but we know who the criminals are. And the criminals are people who wake you up at five o'clock in the morning, pre-dawn raids with grenades, automatic weapons and things like that, uh, uh, and who rob your house, who come to your house and rob your house, come to your office and rob your, your offices, which is the history of this damn relationship. That's how I got here through robbery. That's how black people came to America through white people coming and taking us and bringing us here. So we haven't forgot that. We will not allow the world to forget that. And ain't no Russian had to tell us that. That's something we experienced through our relationship with you. Uh, so here we are, here we are. Here we are uh, on chapter, chapter five, 155. And obviously I won't be able to read that much. Uh, the history of the party. The development of our party has been dialectical containing within it the history and struggle of African people from the past, which informs our understandings of the present and projections for the future. There was a white guy, a um, really uh, significant guy, wrote a book some time ago. I think it was called 1984. And uh, George Orwell, it's a really important thing he said. He said, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the past controls the future. What is controlling the past? Controlling the past is erasing my name and making me Joe Walla. How the hell did I get to be Joe Walla? How the hell did any African people get to be Simpson and all of these other kinds? Of, who controls the past controls the future? What does it mean? That as long as I'm Joe Walla, I can never discover Africa. I can never discover my, my connection to Africa. Uh, as long as I am who they define me to be, and that's, the, that's controlling the past. Who controls the past controls the future. So how do I get to liberation without having access to my own past, how I got the hell here? If I'm assuming that my history started in some kind of cotton plantation or cotton patch in Mississippi or down south in America, way down upon the Swanee River, that kind of nonsense, then I would never be able to find my way to freedom. Uh, that's why we cannot accept this notion that somehow we got created through slavery and now we are some kind of new African black belt south kind of stuff. We were Africans and we got on the damn boat. It's really important for us to stand the past. Who controls the past controls the future. And who controls the present controls the past. So white power controlling the present defines what the past was. And if they define what the past was, then they control your future. And this is what we're engaged in and why this is so important what we're doing today, talking about 50 years of history at least, and also what we say here, that the development of our party has been dialectical, containing within it the history and struggle of African people from the past, which informs our understanding of the present and our projections for the future. Our party emerged in 1972 from the actual resistance of Africans fighting colonial domination in the US and in Africa. Our ideological trajectory comes directly from our attempts to solve the real pressing practical problems confronting our movement against the imperialist white power. Who controls the past? What in the hell is South Africa? Who controls the past? They're gonna come and steal our land and then name it South Africa, call themselves South Africans and whatever, act like they've always been here. That's controlling the past, all right? 
They even talk about Native Americans, talking about the indigenous people here. How in the hell can they be Native Americans when there was no such thing as America until a white man came and stole it and named it, right? Who controls the past controls the future. This is part of what we're looking at. So our history is based in the most radical activist sector of what is popularly known as the civil rights movement. Unlike the civil rights movement and organizations whose focus was on changing or reforming America, ours was a selfish motivation to win the liberation of African people led by the African working class, regardless of its consequences for America or any other power, regardless of its consequences for America or any other power. Our responsibility is to ourselves as an oppressed people who have been kidnapped and brutalized and dispersed around the world against our will. Our party was born of the brutal repression that destroyed our movement for happiness and the return of our stolen resources in the 1960s. Our mission was defined in part by that repression. We were the living embodiments of the words of Fred Hampton, Black Panther Party leader murdered by US agents on December 4th, 1969. And he said, you can kill a revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. And Fred Hampton was killed in 1969 by the same forces who attacked my house, attacked Achilles house on July uh, 29th this year. The same people murdered Fred Hampton. They still on the same rampage. The same people came to Africa, kidnapped me, brought me here, snatched me from our, from our people, et cetera. That's the same ones who attacked us on July. And I'm supposed to forget that. And they want to keep us living in some kind of silo so they can continue to control the past. And that's why they attack us, because we won't allow them to control the past, because we are struggling to take power now. You know, so the 1960s saw the imperialist murders of Patrice Lumumba and the wounded and captured Che Guevara. And the people need to remember this, that, that Che, they, they wounded Che Guevara and captured him. He was not dead. They wounded him and captured him. The CIA, the American CIA, a branch of the same state that we are talking about that's associated with the FBI. They first wounded Che. What was Che doing? Was he robbing people? Was he raping people? Uh, was he committing any kind of offense like this? No, Che was on a mission for the liberation of the oppressed people. He was in Bolivia and then trying to organize people so they can take their own power from the neocolonialism that had been imposed on Bolivia by the imperialists, by the United States, by the other forces there. And they wounded him. They have been tracking him down. They wounded him. And after they, they wounded him, captured him, then they held him for a day or so and murdered him. There's no way to get around that. There's a way that people discuss Che Guevara. And that was on October 9th, 1967. That was on my birthday. There's, there's no way to get around the question of what happened to Che. You know, he was not somebody who was killed in battle. You understand what I'm saying? He was not killed in battle. There's a Geneva Convention that says something about how you're supposed to treat wounded captives. And, and, and they, there's no, no, no concern about uh, uh, conventions and things. It's a war without terms against the colonized peoples of the world. And so they wounded Che. They captured Che and hung around for a day or two, and then they murdered him. Uh, so again, the 1960s saw the imperialist murders of Patrice Lumumba and the wounded and captured Che Guevara, along with the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah, Malcolm, Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Fred Hampton, Bobby Hutton, and Carl Hampton, among the victims of the imperialist counterinsurgency that attempted to reverse the course of history to reverse the course of history. And because what we're saying is human progress is that which is being advanced by colonized and oppressed people to overturn slavery. That's all people are fighting for, to overturn imperialist slavery that has been imposed on the world. And that is the future. That is progress to end slavery, to end oppression, to end colonialism is human progress. And every effort that's uh, fighting against that is trying to hold back the forces of history. It won't work. So uh, as revolutionaries were jailed and assassinated throughout the United States, 
and the world. The birth of our party constituted an organizational way forward. It was necessary to move beyond the era of protest and organize to win and wield political power. This required the existence of a political party, the highest expression of the will to acquire power. The founding of our party was an explicit statement of our recognition that we were not fighting for just any kind of power, but for revolutionary power in the hands of a revolutionary class, the African working class. But the question of power is critical too, because we understood this in the 1960s, which became necessary for the imperialist powers of the world to organize to kill us and, and destroy us. And in the, and they having done that uh, to destroy the prevailing ideas, uh, most progressive ideas uh, in the world that Patrice Lumumba and Nkrumah and Che Guevara and, uh, and, and Cabral and all kinds of forces uh, were talked in, in Malcolm X. Uh, these were the people who were projecting a different kind of future. A hundred and some odd years ago, Marcus Garvey was on the same trajectory. These are attempts to hold back the forces of history to keep progress from happening, to keep a section, a majority of the people of the world living under colonial domination, which is to say white, 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 white denomination. In fact, whiteness came into existence through the process of capturing us and capturing our territories. They invented whiteness uh, as to mean powerful because we don't know nobody who's really white, do we? I mean, look at it. I mean, you don't know anybody who's really white. This is a political concept. Uh, that they created and that helps to distinguish the colonized from the colonizer. And it's no accident. Uh, just uh, on a couple of days ago, I was uh, at uh, 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 some uh, kind of institution and I'm looking around and everybody who's serving is dark skinned. All the servants in the damn place are dark skinned. All the servants, Africans and other people from other places around the world, because that's who is the colonizer. And that's why white people know how to kill us, whether you are African like I am African, or whether you look like you might be Mexican or something else, it's just what you do. It's, uh, you, you kill these people because you, this is a distinction between the colonized and the colonizer. Colonizer means white. That's what objectively it has come to mean. It's a political characterization that was defined by them. Uh, and to do so, so you have a society, and when I say society in this instance, I'm not talking about what's called France or Italy. Italy didn't even exist until 1861, I think it was. Did you know that? Yeah, so you had this guy, this, this guy uh, who uh, organized uh, in this territory and said something to the effect that we have now created Italy, we must create Italians now. And, uh, uh, and they act like they've always been there always been like that, ain't always been like, I mean, uh, even uh, formal legal colonial slavery in the United States had not been ended by the time this thing called Italy uh, was created. Did you know that? Yeah, that's the reality. So much of the world got its definition like that. This is a problem for most of the people who call themselves quote unquote Americans, because much of the many of the territories and lands that they come from, uh, so-called countries that they come from, so-called nations that they come from, didn't exist didn't exist uh, when they came and took this territory from the indigenous. If they ain't got this, they ain't got nothing. You can't go, you know, there was no Italy. You're talking about I'm an Italian American. You, you might be an American, but uh, this Italy thing was uh, something that was created in 1861. And many of the so-called countries and, and things like so-called nations, nationalities and white, because ain't no bunch of nationalities, by the way, in this territory we call Europe is one. It's called Europe, European. They're European, uh, the nation, but many of them got their definition. And that's really important to understand also when you're talking about the national question, because their, uh, their achievement of a common identity, a sense of sameness tied to a particular kind of political economy came as a consequence of colonial slavery. Didn't exist, most of them before then. You with me? Yeah. Anyway, I'm talking, I'm diverting, on I? Let's see, it's, uh, I'm trying to, okay, so I'm gonna stop doing that. Uh, prior to the emergence of the African People's Socialist Party, the Black Panther Party was the only revolutionary political party of consequence, uh, bearing the brunt of much of the counterinsurgent repression that left its remnants in a state of retreat. Most 
other remaining African political groupings uh, preferred to shun designation as a party and avoided the internal dynamics necessary uh, to shape and define the class character of a revolutionary organization. That's what we engage in all the time. We deal with such issues like criticism, self-criticism. We do the political reports that say, this is how things are. We go through these struggles. We hold ourselves to certain uh, uh, kinds of principles, organizational and, and, and political principles. This is part of the struggle that has to happen if you're going to be a, a revolutionary, a, a class-based party. Otherwise, you can just be anything. Right. And so most organizations did they 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 refused to uh, develop the kind of organization that the party uh, uh, has become. So uh, this resulted in ambiguity that most often allowed militant nationalist petty bourgeois organizations to hide their class content behind radical sounding names. However, we were clear that we had to have a revolutionary party rooted in the African working class and committed to African liberation, unification, and socialism. We were also convinced that the tendency of some groups to move toward coalition building uh, as the central component of their work was wrong. We needed a revolutionary party to lead the revolutionary African working class to power. And they didn't kill uh, Lumumba because he didn't have a coalition. They didn't murder Malcolm because they didn't have a coalition. Make, they were moving toward the uh, struggle for the acquisition of political power uh, and, uh, and moving uh, toward uh, the necessary definition of our reality uh, that would give shape uh, to what it is that we were fighting for. So uh, political parties exist in class societies and always serve the interests of particular classes. An examination of their program usually reveals what class is being served by a particular organization. Our objective was to create a party explicit in its class content and its mission to liberate Africa and African people under the leadership of the African working class. Everybody want to ride on this train, get your ticket punched. You've got to become a part of and servant of the African working class. Our commitment to the elevation of the working class to power does not come from a misguided romantic attachment to our own uh, version of the white man's so-called noble savage. Rather, you know what I mean, right? I mean, when we talk about the working class, it ain't some, some you know, idea that the workers, are, this noble savages are purer than everybody else because they're the workers, et cetera, et cetera. No, that's not what it's about. Rather, it is due to an understanding that all value in society, all the wealth that constitutes a summation of social production stems from the labor of the workers who under capitalism never received the value of their labor. Uh, this is a fundamental contradiction within the system of capitalism. The private ownership and control of the means of production versus the socialized production by workers who only own their capacity to work. The capitalist class owns all the wealth produced by the labor of the workers. Because of private ownership, the capitalist class monopolizes authority in society, while the workers are just so much jetsam, easily replaced from the ranks of millions of others who desperate by the fact that the product of their labor is perpetually expropriated by a non-producing parasitic ruling class. The African liberation sought by African internationalism is a liberation that will empower the working class and resolve the contradiction in society revolving around private ownership and socialized production. African internationalism means black power to the African working class. It means elevation of the African working class to the position of ruling class. The Black Liberation Movement of the 1960s was crushed before the various contending political and ideological lines within the movement could develop fully and play themselves out on the political battlefield of revolutionary ideas. Our party represents a revolutionary continuum linking the immediate past of defeat with the present and future. We were never a part of the defeat. We were born as a revolutionary organization that simply moved from one level of struggle to another, higher level of struggle. And uh, how long am I gonna go before we stop? At 45? 
the imperialist U.S. colonial state never succeeded in driving us completely underground and out of active political life, which is a thing that we have to be concerned with right now, because the attack by the state, uh, uh, given their uh, druggers, we would have to go underground now. We would be denied access to the political space that actually uh, has been created by Black people. Uh, if there's anybody, white people, uh, gay people, women, anybody in this country and much of the world who experienced what they might call democratic rights, it's been in the wake of struggle of black people. Africans are the ones who really forced anything that looks like democracy in this country. I'm saying this factually, you can track it down. You can look at various uh, portions of the history, uh, iterations of the history that shows that to be the case. So uh, they never, uh, so we don't, we want to have uh, what they characterize as democratic rights. When they say free speech, we want that free speech. We want it. Uh, and this is what they want to keep us from doing. For example, they say that uh, 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 this legitimate way to achieve political power uh, is through elections. Uh, we uh, fought for that. I fought for that. I faced uh, 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 frothing at the mouth uh, crackers in, in Madison, Florida, uh, and, and, and the sheriff who wanted to put me in jail in Lachua County, Florida, for just trying to organize African people to vote. I did that. And, and so uh, that's trying to have access to the, to the democratic space. And when Akile ran for office uh, saying, make the South Side black again, that was using that space to fight against gentrification, the powerful economic forces that's devouring African communities here and around the world, throughout this country and around the world. Make it black again. That's what we are saying. That's trying to organize and mobilize African people to a consciousness of what the political objectives have to be. When we say reparations and say, take back the dome, that dome, which is right down the street from where we are now, uh, used to be an African community uh, where the current mayor, uh, uh, daddy, uh, help to take and give to uh, white power and the name of uh, the lie that they were going to create jobs uh, for African people. And there's never been just a baseball. And it did and put a baseball uh, a stadium there before they even had a baseball team. And, 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 and so this is, we want that political space to be able to say, make St. Petersburg black again. You can't handle that. What's the matter with you? You can't handle us saying, make St. the South Side black again. You can't handle somebody saying reparations. You, this great democracy, you say, and you can't even, you can't even handle that discussion so that you come to houses at five o'clock in the morning with grenades and armored vehicles and automatic weapons because somebody is saying make St. Southside black again, because somebody is saying unity through reparations. <laughs> We want that democratic space. We fought for it. Black people died for it. You know, you hear African people all the time, liberals, we fought and died for the right to vote. No, not just the right to vote. We fought and died for the right to be able to put our political objectives out there in the world and to organize Black people around them. And what happened was they bombed our churches, killed three Black girls in Birmingham in 1963. They shot uh, Vernon Jordan in the back. Uh, they did all kinds of horrible things to us just cause we were talking about voting, right to vote. And now the FBI is gonna attack our houses and 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 then uh, put us in the jail. Uh, and they saying the same thing that the white people were saying there, the outside agitators are the ones who sent you here. Uh, you must be a communist, you must be a Russian, et cetera. I wanna sue the FBI uh, for violation of 1965 Voting Rights Act. That's why we need a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Cause we don't intend to lay back passively they have to defend their system. What we are fighting against is their system. And they are, are now defending their system at five o'clock in the morning raids against us. We want them to have to fight their system based on the terms that they established for the existence of their system and our oppression. So let's go to court with them. But to do that, y'all got to send some money. Y'all got to have to join into this campaign that we're in, engaged in right now. So it is now, oh, I've exhausted all the time. Uh, I want people to really, uh, I only got to something like five pages, uh, four pages in this uh, part of the political report and the history of the party. And I'm really uh, imploring uh, all of you 
uh, to read this document uh, because you will find so much that's here. And uh, it defies everything, every lie, every scheme uh, that's been told about who we are. And I want you also, uh, depending on where you are, you know, come to St. Petersburg, Florida and see who we are, see what we do. Come to this Uhura house that they attack. Uh, come to uh, St. Louis, uh, Missouri. See how we've transformed the entire African community that they crushed down and beat uh, into uh, a, a sense of destitution and what have you. See how that's being transformed as a consequence of the party. Go to Everton West uh, in South Africa and see the work that we do there. Uh, and the various other places around the world where we are located, uh, come uh, to uh, Philadelphia and go to Uhura Furniture uh, and go to, uh, uh, I think the, I'm not sure if the, if the uh, One Africa, One Nation uh, market is still uh, open right now, but uh, if it is, uh, you know, Google it, check it out. Now we, there, there are hundreds of people, uh, uh, vendors, families. I mean, that market where thousands of African people come uh, to that market. It's a culture center. It's the ability for African people to get together uh, where we uh, uh, we spend money with each other, so that uh, so that it doesn't all go to Walmart, and which is also a problem that they have because every success we have negates their success in terms of economics in our lives. That's why we say we want dual and contending power, not just dual power. People like to say that they got dual power because the white people got uh, a, a school, and then we can create a school that we charge uh, Africans that are like trillion dollars to attend. But it's a contending power. It's a power that consciously is engaged in contending with the ability of the colonizers to control our lives. That's what most of the world is about right now. That's why even in a place like Mali, uh, Google uh, the uh, Mali, this, the uh, representative of the United Nations, right now, what just, just had and how uh, Mali is talking about what France, stealing every damn thing and blaming Mali, starving people uh, in Mali to try to force them uh, to kowtow, uh, which itself is a reactionary uh, colonial term, forcing them, you know, to bow down uh, uh, to, uh, to France and trying to cast this uh, aspersion because most of how people understand the world is how we've been taught about the world from the colonizer. Even the oppressed have been taught to view ourselves through the lenses of the colonizer, but see how that's changing and see how that's a real threat uh, to the colonial powers of the world and see the role of the African People's Socialist Party in changing that and struggling against how the world is perceived and why this study that we have on today is so significant, why you need to read uh, chapter five that we're just talking about in the entire political report. Uhuru, thank you, comrade. Thank you, for chairman. <clears throat> So I want to really appreciate uh, just that overview. And I know we didn't get uh, very far into the chapter, but I just, uh, you know, I thought that everything that you've laid out was extremely profound, really important to, uh, you know, add to this documentary that we watched. And of course, we did uh, mention where you can get this book if you don't have it yet at the burningspear.store. It is an uneasy equilibrium. So um, we don't have a lot of questions, Chairman, that have come in, but I do want to go through some of the comments and you might want to speak to some of it as well. Um, but just want to acknowledge where people are watching from. We have Portland, Oregon, Chicago, Illinois, Nairobi, Kenya, St. Louis, Missouri, Boston, Massachusetts, San Diego, California, Fargo, North Dakota, Montreal, Canada, Irvington, New Jersey, Fort Myers, Florida, Frederick, Maryland, um, Hempstead, New York, Gainesville, Florida, Occupy, Azania, or South Africa, Little Rock, Arkansas, Greenville, South Carolina, Kampala, Uganda, Largo, Florida, Ecuador, Oklahoma, Illahi, Turtle Island, and Grenada, West Indies uh, tuned in with us today. So, who, mm. comrades, thank you for tuning in. Um, this, com this comment came in from comrade uh, Kenya Yeshitela, who said, this has been a very emotional study. The party continues to lead the way through theory and practice. Long live the APSP, long live Chairman Amali and the African Revolution. Uhuru, comrade Kenya. Um, <clears throat> Prester John on YouTube, commented that um, in the 1980s, the South African government developed chemical weapons specifically designed to harm Africans called Project Coast. This program received material and financial support from the state of Israel and, C and the CDC, the Center of Disease Control in the United States. Um, and uh, Comrade Norman Jalali Richmond um, in Canada um, wanted to see Chairman, if you would, uh, if you could speak on uh, Comrade Brother Saladin Muhammad uh, joining the ancestors. So, 
that's what we've got, uh, Chairman. Oh, thank you, uh, Comrade Jalali. I just wanted to uh, mention uh, Comrade Saladin Mohammed, uh, who was a really uh, important force of the uh, African liberation movement uh, as it expressed itself in the United States. We characterized as the US front of the African revolution. And uh, uh, I've known, I knew Saladin, uh, I think since the 1960s. Uh, we worked together uh, on the 1976 um, bicentennial uh, without colonies uh, mobilization that happened in Philadelphia where the United States was engaged in drumming up as much white nationalist patriotism as possible uh, to unite uh, the, the white uh, people the Americans uh, 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 in the face of the growing contradictions that were happening. You gotta remember this was 1976, the, based on the, on the 1776, uh, uh, something happened that, uh, that uh, allowed uh, them to declare ownership of this uh, territory and, and their freedoms and stuff. That is to say the white people. Uh, and of course, this was a time where, this is 1776, you understand? And what was the station of African people here in most of the world in 1776? But this was the glorious moment uh, on indigenous land and what have you. And um, uh, this was even before the successful Haitian revolution, wasn't it? Uh, of uh, 1791, started in 1791, and then uh, took a great leap with, uh, uh, 1804, still ain't finished yet. We still got work to do, but, uh, but Saladin and I worked together with that. And uh, Saladin uh, was uh, with the African People's Party. And uh, he was a comrade of and worked with uh, comrade uh, uh, Maxwell Stanford, who came to be known as uh, Muhammad Ahmed. And he was a comrade of Robert Williams uh, from 1957, who was, uh, with uh, in in uh, North Carolina, uh, in fact, the head of the NAACP when he organized people there to fight against the Ku Klux Klan by arming themselves, the NAACP naturally normally fired him um, uh, for having the audacity to help the people to live, <laughs> and uh, uh, in the face of their terror, uh, he. So anyway, uh, Ella Baker, he you know he knew these comrades. He worked with them. He worked with Yuri Kuchiyama. Uh, who was with Malcolm uh, when when Malcolm was assassinated? So he was a, a very important force. We had uh, real serious ideological differences, but the thing about uh, Saladin that I find uh, so significant and important, uh, first of all, the, the the fact that he built the African People's Party. He didn't build the African uh, American People's Party. Uh, he built the African People's Party. He uh, was associated with Revolutionary Action Movement through Max Stanford, at least, uh, which was one of the uh, significant uh, cutting edge uh, movement, uh, you know, during a really important uh, point of our struggle who was, that was clearer uh, on certain issues than, than most of us were at the time. And um, <clears throat> like I said, he was just a, a, a really important force. We, we had, you know, we had ideological and political differences, but I respected him. <clears throat> and I think the respect was mutual. Uh, we worked together. He uh, was consistent. Uh, he never not struggled. And, uh, and when he died, he was in struggle, you know, with the system itself. However, he defined it differently from how I defined it. Saladin was there. And so we say Saladin Muhammad Presente. Yeah, Presente Uhuru. <laughs> so that's all of the questions that we've gotten in. Um, so, all right. So since that's let me oh. let me say this. Um, you mentioned Kenya. Kenya should tell us my daughter. And um, uh, the a thing that that makes that significant because I'm still dealing with, I, I know it's redundant because everybody who's in this study recognize how bogus this whole Russia garbage is. Um, but I remember Kenya was with, <coughs> was with me in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, she's 
She might have been uh, 14 at the time. We were there uh, with the family of Mufundin Lake, who was a giant uh, who most people uh, would forget, I think, if it were not for the kind of work that our party does, um, partially because uh, there was not that much respect uh, given to revolutionary organizations in the South. Um, and uh, see, we were there visiting the family of Mafunda Lake <laughs> and um, the Klan. Um, uh, I don't remember now how we knew that the Klan was moving on us. In fact, uh, Kenya and I, I don't remember if there was anyone else with us, but we were at this, uh, at this uh, motel, hotel. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, my baby, my daughter, I mean, she's, you know, afraid for her life. I mean, because there was an assumption that we were going to be attacked by the Klan. And, and I'm saying that most of our life, lives have been like this. I have two sons uh, who I saw for yesterday, who uh, for the first time in a while. And uh, we were in Oakland, California. And uh, they were uh, in a house where agents uh, uh, firebombed our house and they barely escaped with their lives. And we have heard no FBI report about that, how to deal with that. We are in a building right now where 27 days before they raided this building, uh, a man pulled up in a car in broad daylight, opened his car trunk. And we know that's how it happened because our security cameras uh, caught it and pulled out of the car trunk a military grenade flamethrower, not uh, something that you use to light charcoals at your uh, 4th of July uh, event, but a flamethrower and broad daylight and torch the uh, 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 15 by 25 foot red, black, and green flag uh, that's perched on a 50 foot flagpole at our place. And when uh, the comrade uh, uh, who was here, a uh, member of the Solidarity Movement, saw him and, and yelled out the window at the guy, uh, he calmly uh, went to his trunk, took off the pack with the uh, flamethrower attachment to it and put it in his trunk and then drove away. And then the police finally came, uh, uh, Homeland Security, FBI, all of these people came uh, and they, uh, Character, they wouldn't even characterize this arson. And they uh, uh, called it some kind of criminal mischief or something to that effect. And this was a dry run. This was a dry run that came 27 days uh, before the attack on the Uhura House. And why was this a dry run? Because the only other time they had attacked this house, this center with military forces, it was mentioned here, was in 1996. When they came in 1996, the community wet met them, met fire with fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, wasn't flamethrower, mm -hmm. but it was other kind of fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, to the point that it forced a helicopter down that people saw. And this helicopter, the thing that concerned the people because it looked like what they had just done to move in 1985, when they dropped the bomb on the African community. And people are talking to us about Russians having to tell us that we are oppressed, that we have to be organized based on the influence of Russia. Please. <laughs> anyway, I just thought it was important to mention those things. And I see, uh, yeah, Uhuru, someone else was. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna just do it like this. All right, so um, I'm just gonna, we're gonna use that last question to do a closeout, Chairman, because I think it, Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. that's uh, what I'm gonna, uh, um, I'm gonna do that for our closeout question, because um, I think it'll give you a good opportunity to do those remarks. But um, before we get to the closing remarks, I just want to uh, salute this incredible discussion that we've been able to have. Mm -hmm. and wanna thank the Omali Taught Me Show team for helping with this production from the promotions, curriculum development, AV and chat moderation. So much goes into these shows and these comrades pull it all together every week. I also wanna thank all of you for tuning in to today 
today's study, whether you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, we're glad to have you on with us. And so again, before we officially wrap up, I'd like to turn it over to the chairman. And with this last question coming from Comrade Life, who asked Uhuru Chairman, can you say something about organization based on science and African revolutionary theory and your personal longevity and the longevity of the APSP and its organizations? Uhuru, thank you. I think the thing about personal longevity and the longevity of the African People's Socialist Party, I think they go together. And I think at the point uh, where one is ideologically clear, uh, uh, longevity uh, and, and one has theory based in science, uh, uh, one longevity uh, defies this thing that we hear about people who used to be in the movement and they got burned out uh, uh, because most people get burned out because they can't see the future, they can't see the end. But African internationalism show, is, provides us a to what end. And so we know at any given moment where we are located uh, in the history of uh, ending this oppression. And that's the thing that keeps us going. I mean, so even if you kill leaders and arrest leaders and things like that, and plus we built uh, organization in various places around the world, depending upon, of course, at any given moment, uh, the quality of the cadre that we bring into the movement, then it's very hard uh, to, to liquidate that organization. And I think also in terms of my own longevity uh it's the same thing uh the thing that uh, i was up at five o'clock in the morning uh when the fbi came in st louis because i was getting ready to go to the gym to work out uh to do back and biceps <laughs> and uh, uh uh and because uh there was a time where i smoked a lot of cigarettes and where i drank booze and things and then uh, I found myself on one occasion right here in the city of St. Petersburg, just running across the street and I was flat footed. And that struck me. I've never been like that before. And the thing that bothered me about that is uh, that it, it, the, the implication it had for me for doing the work, it truly did. Because people argue all the time, stop smokes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I didn't even expect to live long enough to die from lung cancer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or something like that. But I knew it affected my ability to do the work. So there's the to what end that said, okay, you know, you know, stop smoking, stop eating dead animal parts, uh, uh, you know, uh, work out and do the other kinds of things that will allow you to be here to pursue uh, this struggle. So it's African internationalism, common life, truly, uh, both uh, physically, organizationally, we build certain kind of organization that we're always struggling uh, to make it what it needs to be, always struggling to have cadre what needs to be. And one of the things that I just want to say that in every period uh, we see a certain kind of cadre emerging. And, and uh, there has been a great leap in people who are trying to come into the party now. And what's striking about that is that people are trying to come into the party precisely because they see us under attack. Mm -hmm. So that says something about the quality of forces who we are tracking. That's not just in this country. We just got to communicate from Kenya. Some African in Kenya, we have organization in Kenya, but some African in Kenya says that we have some organization, we want to put it all together and we want to pass a resolution. We want to join uh, the African People's Socialist Party. So the point is, uh, we like baby kids. <laughs> <laughs> what to say? We don't die, we multiply. multiply. <laughs> Okay, Comrade Life. <laughs> uh, Huru, thank you, Comrade Life. Thank you for everyone uh, tuning in. I just want to salute the brilliant leadership of Chairman Amalia Shatella and send a huge thank you to everybody who participated in today's study. This is a reminder to join and support the Hands Off of Huru, Hands Off Africa campaign. And you can do that by going to handsoffofhuru.org. Chairman mentioned lawyers, Chairman mentioned resources, handsoffofhuru.org to make all of that happen. And make sure you follow the chairman on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe to the Bernie Spur TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Omali Taught Me Sunday Study. Hands off of who? Hands off oh. Africa! Relentless! Big <laughs> <laughs>